Perfect. Okay, guys. Uh, yeah, my name is Dima, and uh, I'm really passionate about distributed systems. And now I'm working for Big Data Competence Center. Uh, nowadays, um, it's quite interesting. Uh, you know, it's quite simple to set up Big Data project because a few years ago it was really complex stuff. We need to set up cluster. Uh, we need to. Um, I set up complex infrastructure. It was really um, cost ineffective, but today we have much more tools to set up this project much faster. So today I'm gonna tell you and give you short and succinct introduction to service called Databricks, and uh, also I will share some of my thoughts uh, based on my current experience working with this tool. So uh, let's go a bit deeper. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a few words about main pillars of the service. So basically we have three pillars. It's storage, compute, and toolkit. Storage is just a storage. They call it DBFX, Databricks file system. And basically it's HDFS compliant file system. The main thing about this is that it is not real file system. Uh, basically we mount some underlying cloud uh, file system, for example, S3 or ADLS for Microsoft Azure. Uh, and Databricks, Databricks file system just as a layer to abstract all the storage stuff from a uh, customer. I will tell you a bit more about this service a bit later. For now, let's go deeper. So uh, then on the DBFS, Databricks provides a service called Delta Lake. Delta Lake is basically a library and a data format, and it simplifies our work, day-to-day -day, day -day work, led to data lake structuring, uh, ACID compliance, and et cetera, because it's real pain with just a parquet file. Under Data Lake, uh, we use regular parquet format. Uh, compute. Compute is about computing. So we have Spark clusters and they are running on some bare metal or virtual machines. For us, it doesn't matter because Databricks abstracts everything for us. Uh, there are several types of clusters uh, depending on your needs and uh, they cost different. Uh, but for now, let's think that we have some compute. Uh, also, uh, looks like they use APS-like system under the hood because uh, we have enabled TCP appender for our logs, and we saw logs very similar to AKS. But I can say for sure, I, I, I will say it's 99% because um, Databricks doesn't, uh, <coughs> sorry, doesn't disclose everything related to their internal implementation, but looks like that's true. And uh, the third pillar is a toolkit. Toolkit is a set of different instruments provided by Databricks to simplify our life in big data ecosystem, including file system utils, notebooks, secrets, libraries, uh, and ma machine learning tools, deep learning, and etc. I will tell about this a bit later. So a bit deeper, we can structure Databricks like this. So we have, uh, storage, DBFS, underlying real storage, S3 like, and data lake plus parquet on top of it. And here we have clusters, some abstract clusters, looks like again, AKS or EKS for AWS uh, for real compute, and notebooks and Spark jobs on top of it. Pretty simple stuff. Uh, if you have experience with Spark, uh, so I think nothing new here. Uh, one more thing in the cluster side, um, mean that Databricks provided some performance optimized Spark. They did some changes uh, and these changes are not shared with open source versions. Uh, usually it's, if I understood correctly, it's some uh, set of internal performance scheduling optimization for joins, for um, transforming joins of different times and etc. But again, we don't have info about it. So nothing unfortunately to say here. Let's go deeper to cluster. Uh, there are two major kinds of clusters and basically there, there are three types. Major one is analytical and engineering. Analytical clusters is the most expensive and uh, it's useful for long running clusters. Usually data analysts and data scientists does, uh, do their jobs on them. So it's one big cluster uh, with a few four job scheduling and uh, 
that's pretty it. Because data analysts and data scientists schedule their jobs, uh, do some data visualization and etc. This cluster is again expensive and uh, shared. The second type is engineering clusters. They are twice cheaper than analytical and uh, they are suitable for two cases, long running streaming jobs and short running batch jobs. The main benefit of Databricks here is that we can uh, set up a termination period. So we will not waste our money here. Batch job finished, cluster is dead, that's it. Uh, here can be, this cluster can be shared between several jobs, but my recommendation is to use one job per cluster because of different problems related to jar health and etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, and users of this cluster are usually data engineers. Uh, they are automatically scheduled uh, and uh, nobody cares what happens inside, in, in, except data engineers who should be able to, you know, to read logs and etc. But for from data perspective, nothing really interesting. And engineering clusters uh, have two types, uh, data engineering light and data engineering. The difference uh, in functionality, because data engineering have functionality to run, for example, notebooks with your jobs. Uh, it has connected Delta Lake and uh, something else. Data engineering light is mostly suitable only for migrating existing Spark jobs, for example, from on-premises or for uh, EMR to Databricks. Uh, so it supports only Spark jobs itself and nothing else. Everything, just pure Spark. But it's the cheapest option. So for some cases, it's maybe a preferred way if we just need to run Spark somewhere. Uh, one more difference here is that we cannot specify uh, permissions and uh, role-based access. Yeah, that's usually a problem, but if, if it's not a problem for your company, please go with this solution. For most data engineering jobs, uh, I prefer to use data engineering full, full price, you know, uh, with full um, uh, functionality related to this stuff. Uh, and as you can see, it's, sorry, uh, it's more than twice cheaper than data analytics. So for data analytics clusters, as I already told, they're only useful for some data explore, exploration, exploration and uh, stuff like data, uh, data analytics. Uh, so also we have standard premium SQ, but I don't want to cover it today. Uh, it's a different thing. Uh, let's skip it for now. One important thing here is that here we have price per DBU, like Azure and uh, AWS likes to call their, uh, you know, to hide their costs. And uh, one DBU, as Databricks says, it's one hour of one X R3 X large memory optimized cluster. So for example, if you have a cluster of four nodes, driver node plus three worker nodes, we can calculate DBUs like this, total number of nodes, one plus three. And for example, we run this cluster for two hours, it's eight DBUs. So we, for now we can calculate the total charge for this cluster just to uh, sum cost of eight instance hours for this uh, instances plus a DBU for Databricks. So uh, from first side, it looks like we, we pay only this one, but actually not. We pay one part for AWS and Azure, and the second one for Databricks. So this price is only for Databricks. And uh, you need not to forget about the price of uh, instance itself. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. and. Uh, there are several major types of clusters. They are suitable for different tasks. Regular clusters, it's for data engineering and data analytics, just regular Spark clusters. Also, Databricks provides GPU enabled clusters for deep learning uh, loads like TensorFlow. They even uh, provide some ML um, environment there. Uh, also, we have single node clusters. Uh, it's only Spark driver. From the first side, it looks like we, it's not useful because regular Spark doesn't work in such, uh, in such way, but they did some optimizations and we can use this cluster to, for example, very simple ML model training tasks or data exploratorium on a real small data sets. 
here the main benefit is that we don't waste our money again. We just need to open one file and we use one, one node cluster for that. And pools, pools, well, it's pools. We have a pool of instances and we have a set of clusters, logical clusters in, uh, set up in Databricks. Uh, if we attach these clusters to pool, then these clusters will try to take instances for their load from this pool. And then it works like regular pool. If it's enough uh, instances there, it will take there. Uh, if it's not, it will set up a new one and then decrease, increase uh, pool uh, amount of instances in the, in the pool. Uh, the main benefit here that we have much lower uh, cluster setup time because instances are already there, they are warm, they can be attached and used right away after attach, actually. Okay, that's about clusters. One more huge benefit of Databricks, that's actually one more thing why I think that AKS is under the hood. Uh, they provide a custom container images. So Databricks uses containers uh, to set up Spark clusters. Uh, they provide four types of base images, which can be used with their own and, or can be uh, updated and used as a base image for your custom. Uh, the first type of image is very, very basic. It's, it contains only Spark uh, and some, not a lot of tools provided by Databricks, only needed tools to run Spark cluster. Then we have several more container types with different uh, setup, for example, for ML training, for in notebooks running and etc. And you can use any of this image and then you can uh, build your own image from this. Why do we need this? Well, from practice, I can say that very regular problem in Databricks is jar hell. Um, for example, uh, we used Azure Key Vault integration library. Uh, it's a driver for Azure Key Vault. And Databricks provides uh, also integra transparent integration with Key Vault, but using Databricks utils. Uh, they abstract secret management from the developer side. Um, but in our case, we didn't want to uh, be very tightly coupled with Databricks. We just used it as a platform for running Spark jobs. And uh, we decided to use just regular library. And when we installed our jars on the cluster, Databricks said, okay, I already have, and we got regular jar hell. It occurs that in they installed very, very first version of this library and we used the last one and uh, it was a real problem because, you, you know, regular Spark, uh, jar hell if you work with Java. That's uh, really painful and we had to switch to a different solution, but that's, that's a life here. So if we use basic Databricks image, we can, um, uh, again, we can use very basic Databricks image and install everything manually using our scripts. This gives us flexibility in, setup, in environment setup. I think that's a huge benefit, especially for experienced teams who want to have full control on the cluster creation and what is installed for in this cluster. For example, we need to install um, Prometheus exporter and etc. Uh, basically, yeah, because of monitoring. For example, if we want to install some monitoring, custom monitoring tools to Databricks clusters, and I think custom image is a really good solution for that. Okay, let's go further because it's a very huge topic. We can stay here for a long time. Uh, then I plan to tell you a few words about Delta Lake. Uh, Delta Lake is basically a library on top of Parquet files. If you used, uh, if you develop data lakes, the usual problem with merges, with versioning and et cetera, and ACID compliance, if you wanna be sure the data is correct uh, in a certain layer. So data lake simplifies it and it provides out of the box uh, ACID compliant utilities to keep data uh, in correct state, basically. Uh, basically, it can, Sorry, it contains two things, it parquet files plus transaction logs. Transaction logs uh, is just a log of transactions and it can be uh, understood by name. And uh, because of these transaction logs, we have only append, append only mode for the data. For example, if you deleted this file, Delta Lake will create a new parquet file and the previous one will be marked as uh, obsolete. 
Uh, that means that we have a lot of garbage and we need to do some cleanup jobs from time to time. They provide um, a vacuum uh, instruction to remove everything not needed, but they have problems with vacuuming. If we run, for example, streaming job plus vacuum in parallel, it can have different consequences. We need to uh, be sure that everything is okay. So, but again, it's not a topic for this presentation, so please read it in documentation. And one more pretty good tool and thing that we can say about Delta Lake and is that we can build a streaming pipeline only using Spark streaming and Delta Lake. So we don't need Kafka, but in, this, in such case, uh, it's very limited of functionality. For now, it supports only updates and uh, inserts, no deletes, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe they will introduce them later, but for now, that's it. And I'm not sure it is a production ready solution. Uh, maybe they introduced it uh, only for their auto loader feature. Um, but okay, again, for now, it's not fully useful from my perspective. Uh, so, as idea is pretty simple, we just use it for all the areas in Delta Lake. In, in Data Lake. Um, they call it bronze, silver, gold. We can call it uh, raw area prepared and etc. Uh, so, pretty simple thing, just a new format, and uh, it's very useful for us because it simplifies uh, mergers from my perspective again. And um, and and then what we can let's go further. Data factory. Ah, okay, it's data factory integration. Uh, so data bricks can be directly connected to data factory. And uh, we can run notebooks from there, we can run jobs. Uh, so it's pretty simple to do. Uh, just several screens that we have this task here. Uh, and we can utilize all the features of Data Factory uh, for our batch pipelines. Not really interesting thing. And uh, DB utils, very useful thing. Uh, Databricks provides a set of utils to work with different kinds of uh, secrets, notebooks, and etc. all the stuff. Uh, they have much more utils. Here I specified the most uh, useful at the beginning. Oh my God, sorry, my mouse. Uh, useful at the beginning, so file system, dbutils file system. Um, it allows to work with dbfs as a regular file system with copy, move, create, deal, and etc. Uh, commands. That's extremely useful, especially um, because dbfs is also linked as a file system to Spark cluster. We can just uh, work with it like a local file system. That's very good. Uh, notebooks, we can uh, run workflows. So for example, we have a notebook controlling all the workflow, then this notebook based on some um, conditions, set up different notebooks and run them. So using this uh, utility, we can get uh, CRUD operations on notebooks and run, stop, and etc. So manage notebooks, basically. Secrets, as I told, it's an abstract abstraction over Azure Key Vault or AWS KMS. Uh, well, if you plan to work only with Databricks, uh, I think it's pretty useful, but again, it tightly couples your solution with uh, the Databricks itself. Uh, and library utils. Library allows to manage libraries for clusters. Um, Databricks has um, such models and when we upload some libraries and we can attach it to different clusters and clusters during load, cluster during load um, will load this library to, uh, to itself and uh, run everything you need. And here you can delete, update, upload everything else, everything related to libraries. Uh, that's a new feature. I haven't tested it yet. On my current project, uh, some uh, engineers using it already, but they have different problems as, as far as I understood. Uh, so the idea is that Databricks provides kind of ID for no, their notebooks. I don't like this solution, but I think it can be useful, for example, for data scientists and uh, data analysts. They uh, can work with their notebooks, with versioning, all this Git flow stuff uh, directly from web browser. Maybe it's useful, but um, you know, it, it doesn't help us to build full CICD process. Anyway, we need to, to manually script uh, all the other flows. But they provided it, now they're from scratch and integrated with Azure DevOps, with GitHub, because I think it's Microsoft solutions. 
and uh, they say that they can run with GitLab, but we couldn't connect it, unfortunately. Maybe uh, with uh, premium edition. And it looks like this. We can create a project, uh, just specify Git repo where we will store all the IPython notebooks and uh, it will work out of the box, I hope. Uh, okay, and now I want to see, tell you a few stories from real projects. Well, clusters automation, first, first step. Uh, from my perspective, uh, I see the trend to use big data as in microservices environment, microservices approach. What I mean under that? Uh, well, it's a different topic. I think uh, it, uh, it can be a different discussion. But for now, I will say that we can treat any component in our pipeline as a separate microservice, which will run and can run anywhere in Databricks, in Kubernetes, and on any other services, and on premises. And uh, Databricks support this approach from scratch. We can set up clusters per job, and uh, they provide us the main feature, REST API. REST API supports all the operations you can do in Databricks UI. So we can automate absolutely everything. Uh, we can, for example, regular setup is to upload jar file, to set up a cluster, to upload this jar to, the, to this cluster and start the job, streaming job, for example. And everything can be done using REST API. Uh, and that's brilliant. So we can uh, work with big data pipelines as microservices, with separate pipelines, with separate everything, full separation. Previously, uh, they didn't have in this REST API permissions API. Uh, Databricks, again, provides integration with um, uh, roles and users from your, uh, oh my God, I forgot. Uh, okay, with your users from your uh, company. And uh, from UI, it was absolutely simple to allow somebody to run notebook or a job to modify notebook and etc. But unfortunately, it was not available from REST API. So it, it was a pain because we could only upload, but for example, QA team can change something and it's not desirable behavior. Uh, finally, they've added permissions API after three years of usage, finally. Also, they introduced a new tool to automate all your workloads. It's Terraform provider. And we are using it on our current project and looks like it's working fine. The only thing that it uses Terraform state usually uh, to support, to uh, store information about created clusters. And uh, if you lose this state, then next time you'll create everything from scratch. So it, it requires some manual potential manual job to clean up clusters but if the state is okay we can run Terraform scripts from anywhere it will upload jobs again uh, the main benefit is that it will not recreate clusters it will just reload them if uh, version of library changed that's the main benefit uh, and uh, i think it's it's a good tool good tool to replace rest api because it's more um, it's better suited for devops engineers for example and uh, even for developers, I think. Prometheus, uh, Databricks supports integration with monitoring system out of the box for Azure, Azure Local Analytics and uh, AWS. But we don't, we, for that, my client, we didn't like to use these tools. We wanted to introduce Prometheus because we had pretty complex infrastructure and there are a lot of open source services and a lot of Kubernetes and we have we had um, one common place to monitor all the stuff. And we plan to use Prometheus with Databricks Spark clusters also. I don't want to say it was a challenge, but that time we just needed to upload a library called Banzai Cloud and uh, set up a new appender like in Log4j, um, uh, in Log4j manner. It was pretty simple, but for now, we, if I'm not mistaken, we don't, we even don't, um, sorry, we even don't need to upload anything because they provided this Bandai Cloud out of the box. So for now, we just um, expose JMX exporter and uh, connect to Prometheus. Nothing, no problems here, and that's great. 
Also about ELK, uh, pretty the same stuff. And here, basically, we understood that it looks like it is an AKS. We enabled to TCP appender, and uh, yeah, logs were very similar to AKS logs. Databricks Connect. Uh, it's a tool that provides from Databricks, yeah, to work from your local machine with remote Databricks clusters. Uh, it's working only with Python code. It's Python tool. Uh, now we have discussion about this stuff because it unfortunately doesn't allow us to use regular PySpark uh, locally to run your tests, unit tests, I mean, um, and etc. Just to run Spark locally, it replaces PySpark and conflicts with it. So we need to uninstall PySpark and install Databricks Connect. Then we need to specify connectivity information, and after that we'll use remote clusters as your as a clusters for your local lo workloads. Looks like pretty good feature, but uh, from my perspective, it's not good because we cannot mock it. Uh, for now, we have discussion. Maybe we'll find a tool to mock all the stuff, but for now, the solution is not found. Uh, so, and if we use Databricks Connect, we cannot use, for example, Spark testing base to mock um, Spark session to run unit tests because uh, it updates by Spark itself and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't allow to do anything with that. So, this feature is there. Not sure it, it should be used in, if you want to, to work only with Spark and use Databricks as a platform for running and do not have this high cap high coupling with uh, Databricks itself, but it's still there. And um, maybe for some projects, it's a good tool, especially for notebooks. And final thought about uh, my experience. If Databricks is very cheap at start. When you set up several clusters, they have termination period, everything's okay. We just run some workloads and it's pretty cheap. But for example, in our project, we had tens of teams and they spinned up a lot of clusters and uh, a build was kind of several, okay, it was kind of $60,000 per month only for dev and QA workloads. So we should monitor our bill and sometimes it's useful to change your cluster type to a lower price. Uh, because, again, it will be very expensive at some point. Uh, if you are talking about, uh, if, you're, if a cost is very important for you, maybe at some point of time, it's a good idea to move, for example, to Kubernetes. But to start the project, I think Databricks is the best tool if you, you're going to use Spark ecosystem. Um, the last thing from my from my side, uh, I highly recommend Databricks if you want to start with Spark. It's cheap again from at start. It's easy to use, and you can even don't have an ID. You can use notebooks there, and um, it has a lot of integrations out of the box, and performance consideration because it's much faster, for example, than HD inside. To spin up cluster in HD inside, sometimes it takes thirty minutes, uh, but in Databricks it's five minutes four minutes, with this pulse it can be two minutes. Uh, that's basically it from my side and now I'm going to answer all your questions. So, do you have any questions guys? I have a question. Sure. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm just wondering, if uh, there are any way to play with Databricks on my local machine or just to, for my POC project, is there any way to use it locally? Or well, any trial version, stuff like that? You can, I'm uh, not sure they have trial version, but you can um, have a trial account in Azure and then create Databricks there. So they give you, they will give you $300. And if you set up Databricks, but no clusters, it will not cost you anything. So you just register the account, create Databricks, and then uh, use clusters on demand. I think it will be the easiest way and it will be real Databricks. But if you just want to play with Spark, I recommend to install Spark locally and uh, use it, just to use it and that's it. 
Okay, I see, thank you. And uh, the second question is about Delta Lake. As far as I know, the current version is 0 0.7. Mm -hmm. It means that from my perspective, it's not so stable right now. So mm -hmm. what kind of uh, production issues did you have? Or don't you think oh. that it's uh, like ready for production? Good question. Uh, well, I think it's ready for production and it's widely used in different companies in production. Uh, we didn't face any major problems uh, with Delta Lake. Uh, the only thing that, uh, again, vacuuming in parallel with streaming jobs, um, it was an issue there that we, um, for some reason, it removed additional records which were added later. Uh, we didn't find the issue, but maybe it's, it was in our code. Nobody knows for now, uh, but I think uh, it was. It, it's not a major issue not to work with it because it gives you much more flexibility, much more benefit than problems. I think definitely Delta Lake is what you're looking for. Or you can use if you, for example, don't work with Databricks and Spark, maybe you can use Apache Iceberg uh, format. It's pretty similar, but Data, Data Lake, uh, Delta Lake supports more features like merges. Unfortunately, Iceberg doesn't support. So I recommend to take a look at it and um, enjoy, even in production. And do you compare Data Lake with Hoodie? The yes, we, integration. Yes, we did comp comparison analysis and uh, both of them are good. Uh, I think Delta Lake will grow up, but Hoodie is kind of old stuff because it was implemented uh, to cover this gap when we didn't have uh, Databricks provided format. We decided to go with Delta Lake. Could you share us that comparison? Also? Uh, unfortunately not, it's for my previous client. I even don't have it. I would show, but it's in documentation, in their documentation. Oh, thank you. And again, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Again, it was very short introduction just to take a look at some major points. And uh, I think you can take a look at documentation. Basically, Databricks gives you pretty good documentation. I can maybe share some, some, some info. Let's start it. Yeah, so let's go back. Data guide. So they have pretty good documentation with samples, for example, Spark, stream or Spark Structure Streaming. Uh, demo notebooks. You can even copy and paste notebooks to test everything. So I think documentation is pretty good and it can be used to learn Databricks. One more thing they have a YouTube channel and there they present new features and, uh, for example, Last discussion was about the future of Spark. Uh, it was Spark 3.1 and etc. So I highly recommend if you want to work with Spark uh, to watch their videos, maybe even subscribe, not to uh, lose some information. Here you can find absolutely any, everything. Even some, for example, ML flow guide. It's uh, their tool to work with ML models. They support uh, model model training, model serving out of the box and model registry. So it's a good tool also, but again, it's out of scope today, if you're interested. Any more questions? Maybe something related to production again? Hello, uh, actually, please, sorry, I was a little bit late, so I haven't seen all the, uh, the wall uh, presentation. Uh, I have just a question, maybe you faced with some issues with uh, Azure Databricks uh, related to Data Lake or others. That, because uh, recently I faced with some issue when Databricks failed to create cluster uh, when uh, IPs were changed on subnets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes it happens and also sometimes happens some problems related to maybe not Databricks, but for example, Azure. Uh, they have some maintenance or something else and for several, hour, several hours we cannot create cluster. 
Uh, yeah, but it happens very rarely, maybe once per several months. I think it's not a huge problem, but sometimes development can stop. Also, uh, with Databricks led to networks, uh, they have uh, several kinds of setup. Um, first of all, you can, during creation, you can specify that you want to have a new network and uh, it will create a separate network. And uh, this network will not have access to any other Azure services. And you need to specify all these rules and etc. The second option is when you create a virtual network, uh, you specify subnets and etc. And you, during creation of Databricks, you specify this network as a main. So this network will be used by Databricks. For out of the box, it will have access to all your services. And the main thing that you have control under the a number of IP addresses and etc. You have full control under your network. Uh, so for production, I recommend to have this your, uh, manually created network and doesn't allow to Databricks for uh, doesn't allow Databricks to create anything related to this stuff because it will be easier to manage in the future. Um, but again, coming to some issues, sometimes happens. Yeah, that's true. But I think in every cloud, sometimes we have some issues. Also, additional quest that uh, I had is like uh, actually infrastructure is managed. In my case, it was ARM templates, and when redeploying the infrastructure, uh, issues is with network because it's locked to redeploy because it's managed by Databricks. Finally, I mean, when Databricks created and this network is assigned to Databricks, you could not. Do any changes with some with your network? So it's also right. an additional issue. Yeah, that's why I recommend this uh, to specify your network, your personal. Databricks uh, works in this way. It it is created in the resource group in your resource group, but it will create a separate resource group static, which cannot be changed, and it's managed by Databricks. Uh, it's good for, for example some small companies which don't want, they don't have experienced uh, DevOps engineers and they just want to have working solution out of the box. But for huge projects, for enterprises, um, it's highly recommended to create everything manually and doesn't allow it to maintain everything by itself. Additional question, actually, maybe you know why or, or maybe you faced with this issue. Uh, with this managed network when it's previously created and then, uh, I mean, network not created but uh, by Databricks, but previously and assigned to the Databricks. And access to Data Lake is all of for Databricks. Mm -hmm. And sometimes this access, access is failed with 4.403 uh, exception. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that uh, Databricks has no access to the data uh, to data lake. It just some issue with data lakes firewall, and fix it with simple uh, unattaching and reattaching the subnet. Maybe you faced with this, or maybe you find uh, if you faced with this, uh, maybe you know why it happens. Well, I can say that fortunately I haven't faced such issue. Maybe our DevOps team, because mostly my work related to data engineering and architecture, maybe DevOps team faced such thing. Um, can't say for sure, sorry. But it's really interesting, I will ask, because it's really a major thing. It, will, it, it can fail at any point of time. I think maybe issue is connected to, uh, to the same thing, uh, to the network. And yeah. uh, if you create a manual, manually create a separate network, everything will work fine. Excellent. Actually, uh, it's uh, this example from manually created network. Okay, it's interesting. So unfortunately, I don't have a, an answer. For uh, it's it's fortunately <laughs> that you haven't seen this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's fortunately for sure. Okay, any more questions?
Okay, uh, guys, maybe in the future uh, I will prepare one more topic. Um, I think uh, it will be interesting. It, it will be more about uh, architecture of modern uh, big data systems like big data is microservice and etc. about infrastructure setup. Um, I hope it will be interesting and I hope this topic was also interested for you and you are really, um, now you want to take a look at Databricks deeper. Again, service is highly recommended. Pretty good thing. Uh, if you don't have any more questions, thank you. Let's come back to our work. <laughs>